Chapter One of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter One The Rats and Their Son in Law. There once lived in Japan a rat and his wife, folk of noble race who had one beautiful daughter they were exceedingly proud of her charms and dreamed as parents will of the grand marriage she was sure to make in time proud of his pure rodent blood the father saw no son-in-law more to be desired than a young rat of ancient lineage whose attentions to his daughter were very marked this match however brilliant as it was seemed not to the mother's taste like many people who think themselves made out of special clay she had a very poor opinion of her own kind and was ambitious for an alliance with the highest circles ad astra to the stars was her motto she always said and really when one has a daughter of incomparable beauty one may well hope for an equally incomparable son-in-law address yourself to the son at once then cried the impatient father one day there is nothing above him surely quite so i had already thought of it she answered and since you too are in sympathy with the idea we will make our call to-morrow so on the following morning the proud father and the haughty mother rat went together to present their lovely daughter to the orb of day lord son said the mother let me present our only daughter who is so beautiful that there is nothing like her in the whole world naturally we desire a son-in-law as wonderful as she and as you see we have come to you first of all really said the son i am extremely flattered by your proposal but you do me too much honour there is some one greater than i it is the cloud look if you do not believe and at that moment the cloud arrived and with one waft of his folds extinguished the sun with all his golden rays very well let us speak to the cloud then said the mother rat not in the least disconcerted immensely honoured i am sure replied the cloud in his turn but you are again mistaken there is some one greater than i it is the wind you shall see at the same moment along came the wind and with one blow swept the cloud out of sight after which overturning father mother and daughter he tumbled with them pell-mell at the foot of an old wall. "'Quick, quick!' cried the mother rat, struggling to her feet. "'And let us repeat our compliments to the wind.' "'You'd better address yourself to the wall,' growled the wind roughly. "'You see very well he is greater than I, for he stops me and makes me draw back.' No sooner had she heard these words than mother rat faced about and presented her daughter to the wall ah but now the fair rat maiden imitated the wind she drew back also he whom she really adored in her heart of hearts was the fascinating young rat who had paid his court to her so well however to please her mother she had consented to wed the sun in spite of his blinding rays or the cloud in spite of his sulky look even the wind in spite of his brusque manner but an old broken wall no death would be better a thousand times fortunately the wall excused himself like all the rest certainly he said i can stop the wind who can sweep away the cloud who can cover up the sun but there is some one greater than i it is the rat who can pass through my body and can even if he chooses reduce me to powder with his teeth believe me you need seek no better son-in-law greater than the rat there is nothing in the world do you hear that wife do you hear it cried father rat in triumph didn't i always say so quite true you always did returned the mother rat in wonder and suddenly glowed with pride in her ancient name and lineage so they all three went home very happy and contented and on the morrow the lovely rat maiden married her faithful rat lover End of chapter one
Chapter Two of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter Two The Mouse and the Sausage. Once upon a time, a little mouse and a little sausage who loved each other like sisters decided to live together and made their arrangements in such a way that every day one would go to walk in the fields or make purchases in town while the other remained at home to keep the house one day when the little sausage had prepared cabbage for dinner the little mouse who had come back from town with a fine appetite enjoyed it so greatly that she exclaimed how delicious the cabbage is to-day my dear ah answered the little sausage that is because i popped myself into the pot while it was cooking on the next day as it was her turn to prepare the meals the little mouse said to herself now i will do as much for my friend as she did for me we will have lentils for dinner and i will jump into the pot while they are boiling and she let the action follow the word without reflecting that a simple sausage can do some things which are out of the reach of even the wisest mouse when the sausage came home she found the house lonely and silent she called again and again my little mouse mouse of my heart but no one answered then she went to look at the lentils boiling on the stove and alas found within the pot her good little friend who had perished at the post of duty poor mousie with the best intentions in the world had stayed too long at her cookery and when she desired to climb out of the pot had no longer the strength to do so and the poor sausage could never be consoled that is why to-day when you put one in the pan or on the gridiron you will hear her weep and sigh my poor mouse oh my poor mouse End of chapter two Chapter Three of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter Three The Three Wishes. Many years ago, there was an old married man who, although poor, had worked very diligently all his life on his little piece of ground one winter's night as this old man was seated with his wife in front of their comfortable hearth in social chat instead of giving thanks to god for the benefits they enjoyed they spent the time in enumerating the good things possessed by their neighbours and in wishing that they belonged to them instead of my little hut which is on bad soil and only fit to house a donkey in i would like to have the farm of old polanus exclaimed the old man and i added his wife who was annoyed that he did not aspire higher instead of that would like to have our neighbour's house which is nearly new and i continued her husband instead of our old donkey which can scarcely carry an empty sack would like to have polanus's mule and i exclaimed the wife would like to have such a fat porker as our neighbour has to kill some people seem only to wish for a thing in order to get it how i should like to see my wishes accomplished scarcely had she uttered these words than they beheld a most beautiful little woman standing in front of them she was so small that her height could not have been more than eighteen inches while she wore a crown like a queen's upon her head her tunic and veil were almost transparent and seemed made of white smoke while the sparks from the fire crackled and jumped like fireworks about her and sparkled around her as glittering spangles in her hand she bore a little golden sceptre the end of which was formed by a gleaming ruby i am the fairy fortunata she said to them i was passing by here and i have heard your complaints i have so much anxiety to accomplish your desires that i come to promise you the realization of three wishes one to you she said to the wife the other to you to the husband 
and the third must be mutual and agreeable to the desire of you both this last i will agree to in person to-morrow when i will return at this time and until then i leave you to think of what it shall be when she had said these words the beautiful fairy sprang through the flames and disappeared in a cloud of smoke the delight of the worthy couple may be imagined and the number of wishes numerous as suitors at the door of a minister which presented themselves to their minds their desires were so many that not knowing which to select they determined to defer the definite decision to the following day after having had all the night to think the matter over they began to discuss entirely different things and in a little while their conversation recurred to their wealthy neighbours i was at their house to-day said the husband they were making black puddings ah such black puddings it would have done you good to see them i would like to have one of them here replied the wife to roast on the ashes for supper scarcely had she uttered the words than there appeared upon the ashes the most delicious-looking black pudding that could possibly be imagined the woman remained staring at it with open mouth and eyes starting out of her head but her husband jumped up in despair and after striding up and down the room tearing his hair in desperation said through your gluttony you greedy woman we have lost one of the wishes good heavens what a woman this is more stupid than a goose it makes me desperate i detest you and the black pudding too and i wish it were stuck on to your nose no sooner had he spoken than there was the black pudding hanging from the place indicated then was the old man struck with horror and his wife with desperation you see what you have done evil tongue exclaimed she as she made useless exertions to tear the appendage from her nose if i employed my wish badly at least it was to my own disadvantage and not to the injury of any one else but the sin carries its punishment with it for i will not have any other wish nor desire anything else than that the black pudding be taken off my nose wife for heaven's sake what of the new house nothing wife for heaven's sake think of the farm it does not matter my dear let us wish for a fortune and then we will have a golden case for the black pudding i will not hear of it then you would have us left just as we were before that is all i wish for and for all that the man could say nothing could alter his wife's determination who grew more and more enraged with her double nose and could scarcely keep off the dog and the cat who both wished to make free with it when on the following night the fairy appeared and asked them what was their last wish they said to her we see how blind and foolish it is of men to fancy that the realization of their wishes will make them happy nor is happiness in the accomplishment of our wishes but rather in the not having any he is rich who possesses what he wants but happy is he who wishes for nothing End of chapter three chapter four of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter four the fox and the goose a fox and a goose were very great friends the goose which as you know is a very honest and industrious bird said to the fox friend fox i have a little bit of property here and if you like to join with me we will cultivate it between us that would greatly please me answered the fox then it will be necessary to till it together when the season arrives said the goose very well replied the fox a little afterward when they met the goose said it is time to sow the seed that is your business said the fox i have nothing to do with that some months passed when the goose said to the fox friend the grass is choking the wheat it is necessary to weed the field very well answered the fox you see to that it is not my business 
a short time passed when the goose said to the fox friend the wheat is ripe and must be reaped all right said the fox you attend to that it is not my business then the goose for all her good nature began to be distrustful and told her friend the greyhound what had passed the greyhound who was very shrewd saw at once that the fox was going to play off one of his tricks upon the goose's good nature and said to her reap the wheat put it in the barn and hide me in a sheaf of corn without leaving more than one eye uncovered so that i may see all that may happen the goose did as the greyhound had said and after a time the fox arrived and when he saw the barn filled with splendid wheat already thrashed he was very delighted and dancing about sang leo leo the straw and wheat are mine leo leo the straw and wheat are mine as he said this he approached the sheaf in which the greyhound was concealed and on seeing the eye among the straw cried ah there's a grape but it's not ripe replied the greyhound as he leaped out of his hiding place and killed the fox End of chapter four chapter five of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter five if heaven will it once upon a time a galician was returning to his home after having spent some time in seville when he was close to his abode he met some one who inquired where he was going to my native place replied the galician if heaven will it answered the former whether heaven will it or no added the galician to himself already seeing his village from afar and being only separated from its outskirts by a river scarcely had he muttered the words ere he fell into the water and was changed into a frog in this condition the poor man lived for three years being in continual danger from his spiteful foes bad boys leeches and storks at the end of three years another galician returning home happened to pass by there and a wayfarer chancing to ask him whither he was going replied to my native place if heaven will it croaked the frog that poked its head up out of the water and when it had said this the frog which was the first galician of the tale suddenly found itself once more a man he went on his way gayer than easter and having met with another traveller who asked him whither he went he answered him to my own place if heaven will it to see my wife if heaven will it to see my children if heaven will it to see my cow if heaven will it to sow my land if heaven will it so that i may get a good harvest from it if heaven will it and as he religiously added to everything if heaven will it he was allowed to see his wishes accomplished he found his wife and children well his cow became the mother of a fine calf he sowed his field and reaped a good harvest and all because heaven willed it end of chapter five chapter six of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin The Booby An ignorant man who associates with clever people has always been more praised than a wise man who keeps the company of fools. For as much profit and fame as a man gains from the former, so much wealth and honor one may lose by the fault of the latter. And as the proof of the pudding is in the eating, you will know from the story that I am going to tell you whether my proposition is true. There was once a man who was as rich as the sea, but as there never can be any perfect happiness in this world he had a son so idle and good for nothing that he could not tell a carob from a cucumber 
So, being unable any longer to put up with his folly, he gave him a good handful of crowns and sent him to travel to the Levant, for he well knew that seeing various countries and mixing with diverse people works genius, sharpens the judgment, and makes men expert. Moshone, for that was the name of the son, got on horseback and began his journey towards Venice, the arsenal of the wonders of the world, to embark on board some vessel bound for Cairo. And when he had traveled a good day's journey, he met with a person who was standing fixed at the foot of a poplar, to whom he said, What is your name, my lad? Whence are you? And what is your trade? The lad replied, My name is Lightning. I am from Ireland, and I run like the wind. I should like to see proof of it, said Moshone. And Lightning answered, Wait a moment, and you will see whether it is dust or flour. When they stood waiting a little while, a doe came bounding over the plain, and Lightning, letting her pass on some way to give himself a handicap, darted after her so rapidly and light of foot that he would have gone over plains covered with flour without leaving the mark of his shoe, and in four bounds he came up on her. Moshone, amazed at this exploit, asked if he would come and live with him and promised to pay him a salary. So Lightning consented, and they went on their way together. But they had not journeyed many miles when they met another youth, to whom Mashone said, What is your name, comrade? What country are you from? And what's your trade? My name, replied the lad, is Hare's Ear. I am from Vale Curious, and when I put my ear to the ground, I hear all that is passing in the world without stirring from the spot. I perceive the monopolies and the agreements of tradespeople to raise the prices of all things, the ill offices of courtiers, the appointments of lawyers, the plots of robbers, the reports of spies, the complaints of servants, the gossiping of old women and the oaths of service, so that neither Lucian's cox nor Francois's lantern discovered so much as my ears can. If that be true, said Michonne, tell me what they are saying at my home. So the lad put his ear to the ground and replied, An old man is talking to his wife and saying, Praise be soul and Leah. I have got rid of my sight of that fellow, Michonne, that nail in my heart, with his face of old-fashioned crockery. By traveling through the world he will at least become a man, and no longer be such a stupid donkey, such a simpleton, such a lose-the-day fellow, such a— Stop, stop, cried Mashone. You told the truth, and I believe you, so come along with me, for you have found the road to good luck. So they all went on together, and traveled ten miles farther, when they met another man to whom Mashone said, My brave fellow, where are you born, and what can you do in the world? And the man answered, My name is Shoot Straight. I am from Castle Aimwell, and I shoot with a crossbow so point-blank as to hit a crab-apple in the middle. I would like to see a proof, said Michonne. So the lad charged his crossbow, took aim, and made a pea-leap from the top of a stone window. Michonne took him also, like the others, into his company, and they traveled on another day's journey, until they came to some people who were building a large pier in the scorching heat of the sun, and who might well say, Boy, put water to the wind, for my heart is burning. So Mashone had compassion on them and said, My masters, how is it you have the heart to stand in this furnace, which is bound to roast a buffalo? And one of them answered, Ah, we are as cool as roses, for we have a young man here who blows upon us from behind in such a manner that seems as if the west wind is blowing. Let me see him, I pray, cried Mashone. And so the mason called the lad, and Mashone said to him, Tell me, by the life of your father, what is your name? What country are you from? And what is your profession? And the lad replied, My name is Blowblast. I am from Windy Land, and I can make all the winds with my mouth. If you wish a zephyr, I will breathe one that will send you into transports. If you wish for a squall, I will blow down houses. Seeing is believing, said Michonne, whereupon Blowblast breathed at first quite gently, so that it seemed to be the wind that blows in Pasilipo towards evening. Then, turning suddenly to some trees, he sent forth such a furious blast that it uprooted a row of oaks. So they traveled on till they came to Fairflower the king of which place had a daughter who ran like the wind and could pass over the waving corn without bending an ear, and the king had issued a proclamation that whoever should overtake her in running should have her as wife, and whoever was left behind should lose his head. Moshone arrived in this country and heard the proclamation. He went straight to the king and offered to run with the daughter, making the wise agreement either to win the race or leave his noddle there. But in the morning he sent to inform the king that he was taken ill, and, being unable to run himself, he would send another man in his place. Come who will, said Sienatella, for that was the king's daughter. I care not a fig, it is all one to me. So when the great square was filled with people come to see the race, insomuch that the men swarmed like ants, and the windows and roofs were all as full as an egg, lightning came out and took his stand at the top of the square waiting for the signal, and lo, forth came Sienatella, dressed in a little gown tucked halfway up to her knees, and a neat and pretty little shoe with a single sole. 
Then they placed themselves shoulder to shoulder, and, as soon as the tarantara and the two two of the trumpets was heard, off they darted, running at such a rate that their hair touched their shoulders, and in truth they seemed just like foxes with the greyhounds after them, horses broken loose from the stable, dogs with kettles tied to their tails, or jackasses with furze bushes behind them. But Lightning, as he was by name and nature, left the princess more than a hand's breadth behind him, and came first to the goal. Then you should have heard the buzzing and shouting and cries in the uproar, the whistling and clapping of all the people calling out, Hurrah! Long live the stranger! Whereat Sinatella's face turned as red as a schoolboy's who was going to be whipped, and she stood lost with shame and confusion at seeing herself vanquished. But as there were to be two heats to the race, she fell to planning her revenge for this affront, and, going home, she put a charm in her ring with such a power that if any one had it on his finger, his legs would toddle so that he would not be able to walk, much less run, and she sent it as a present to Lightning, begging him to wear it on his finger for love of her. Hare's ear, who heard this trick plotted between the father and daughter, said nothing, and wanted to see the upshot of the affair, and when at the trumpeting of the birds they returned to the field, at the usual signal they fell to plying their heels. But if Sienatella was like another Atlanta, Lightning had become like a shoulder-slipped ass and a foundered horse for he could not stir a step, but shoot straight, who saw this coming danger, and heard from Harry's ear how matters stood, laid hold on his crossbow and shot the arrow so exactly that it hit Lightning's finger, and outshot the stone from the ring in which the virtue of the charm lay, whereupon his legs that had been tied were set free, and with four good leaps he passed Sienatella and won the race. The king, seeing the palm thus carried off by this figure of a blockhead, by a simpleton, the triumph of a fool, and taking counsel, bethought himself seriously whether or not he should give him his daughter, and taking counsel with the wiseacres of his court, they replied that Sienatella was not a mouthful for the tooth of such a miserable dog and lose the day bird, so that, without breaking his word, he might commute the terms of his daughter with a gift of crowns, which would be more to the taste of a poor beggar like Mashone than all the women in the world. This advice pleased the king, and he asked Mashone how much money he would take to consider a wife who had been promised. Then Mashone, after consulting the others, said, I will take as much gold and silver as one of my comrades can carry on his back. The king consented, whereupon they brought strong back, and on him began to lay bales of ducats, large purses full of crowns, pails of silver money, and kettles full of chains and rings. But the more they loaded him, the firmer he stood, just like a tower, so that the treasurer, the bankers, the sirs, and the money dealers of the city did not suffice. And the king sent to all of the great people in every direction to borrow their silver candlesticks, basins, jugs, plates, brasses, and baskets, and yet there was not enough to make up a full load. At length, Mashone and his companions went away, however not laden, but tired and satisfied. When the counselors saw what heaps of stores these four miserable fellows were carrying off, they said to the king that it was a great piece of nonsense to load them with all the sinews of his kingdom and that it would be well to send people after them to lessen the load of that atlas who was carrying on his shoulders a world of treasure. The king gave ear to this advice, and immediately dispatched a party of men, foot and horse, to overtake Mashone and his friends. But Hare's ear, who had heard this counsel, informed his comrades, and while the dust was rising to the sky from the tramping of those who were coming to unload the rich cargo, Blowblast, seeing that things were come to a bad pass, began to blow at such a rate that he not only made the enemies fall flat on the ground, but he sent them flying more than a mile distant, as a north wind does those people who pass through his country. So, without meeting any more hindrances, Mashone arrived at his father's house, where he shared the booty with his companions, since the saying goes, a good deed deserves a good mead. So he sent them away content and happy, but he stayed with his father, rich beyond measure, giving no lie to the saying, heaven sends biscuits to him who has no teeth. End of chapter 6 The Booby Chapter 7 of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 7 The Months. It is a saying worthy to be written in letters as big as those on a catafalque that silence never harmed any one and let it not be imagined that those slanderers who never speak well of others but are always cutting and stinging and pinching and biting ever gain anything by their malice for when the bags come to be shaken out it has always been seen and is so still that while the good word gains love and profit 
slander brings enmity and ruin and when you shall have heard how this happens you will see i speak with reason once upon a time there were two brothers Sian, who was as rich as a lord and lise who had barely enough to live upon but poor as one was in fortune so pitiful was the other in mind for he would not have given his brother a farthing were it to save his life so that poor lise in despair left his country and set out to wander over the world and he wandered on and on till one wet and cold evening he came to an inn where he found twelve youths seated around a fire who when they saw poor lise benumbed with cold partly from the severe season and partly from his ragged clothes invited him to sit down by the fire lise accepted the invitation for he needed it greatly and began to warm himself and as he was doing so one of the young men whose face was such a picture of moroseness as to make you die of a fright said to him what think you countrymen of this weather what do i think of it replied lise i think that all the months of the year perform their duty but we who know not what we would have wish to give less praise to heaven and wanting to have things our own way we do not fish deeply enough to the bottom to find out whether what comes into our fancy be good or evil useful or hurtful in winter when it rains we want the sun in leo and in the month of august the clouds to discharge themselves not reflecting that were this the case the seasons would be turned topsy-turvy the seeds sown would be lost the crops would be destroyed the bodies of men would faint away and nature would go head over heels therefore let us leave heaven to its own course for it has made the tree to mitigate with wood the severity of winter and leaves to soften the heat of summer you speak like solomon said the youth but you cannot deny that this month of march in which we now are is very impertinent to send all this frost and rain snow and hail wind and storm these fogs and tempests and other troubles that make one's life a burden you tell only the ill of this poor month replied lise but do not speak of the benefit it yields to us for by bringing forward the spring it commences the production of things helps along the cause with the sun and leads him to the house of the rain the youth was greatly pleased at what lise said for he was in truth no other than march himself who had arrived at that inn with his eleven brothers and to reward lise's goodness who had not found anything evil to say of a month so sad that the shepherds do not like to mention it he gave him a beautiful little casket saying take this and if you want anything only ask for it and opening this box you will see it before you lise thanked the youth with many expressions of respect and laying the little box under his head by way of a pillow he went to sleep as soon however as the sun with the pencil of his rays had touched the dark shadows of the night lise took leave of the youth and set out on his way but he had hardly proceeded fifty steps from the inn when opening the casket he said ah my friend i wish i had a litter lined with cloth and with a little fire inside that i might travel warm and comfortable through the snow no sooner had he uttered the words than there appeared a litter with bearers who lifting him up placed him in it whereupon he told them to carry him home when the hour was come for food lise opened the little box and said i wish for something to eat and instantly there appeared a profusion of the choicest food such a banquet that ten crowned kings might have feasted on it one evening having come to a wood which did not give admittance to the sun because he came through suspected places lise opened the little casket and said i should like to rest to-night on this beautiful spot where the river is making counterpoint on the stones as accompaniment to the canto fermo of the cool breezes and instantly there appeared under an oilcloth tent a couch of fine scarlet with down mattresses covered with a spanish counterpane and sheets as light as a feather 
then he asked for something to eat and in a trice there was set out a sideboard covered with silver and gold fit for a prince and under another tent a table spread with viands the savoury smell of which extended a hundred miles when he had had enough he laid himself down to sleep and as soon as the cock who is the spy of the sun announced to his master that the shades of night were worn and wearied and it was now time for him like a skilful general to fall upon the rear and make a slaughter of them lise opened his little box and said i wish to have a handsome dress for to-day i shall see my brother and i should like to make his mouth water no sooner said than done immediately a princely dress of the richest black velvet appeared with the edgings of red camlet and a lining of yellow cloth embroidered all over which looked like a field of flowers so dressing himself lise got into the litter and soon reached his brother's house when Sian saw his brother arrive with all his splendour and luxury he wished to know what good fortune had befallen him then lise told him of the youths whom he had met at the inn and of the present they had made him but he kept to himself the conversation of the youths Sian was all impatience to get away from his brother and told him to go and rest himself as he was no doubt tired then he started post haste and soon arrived at the inn where finding the same youths he fell into chat with them and when the youth asked him the same question what he thought of the month of march Sian, making a big mouth said confound the miserable month the enemy of the shepherds which stirs up all the ill humours and brings sickness to our bodies a month of which whenever we want to announce ruin to a man we say go march has shaved you a month in short so hateful that it would be the best fortune for the world the greatest blessing to the earth the greatest gain to men were it excluded from the band of brothers march who heard himself thus slandered suppressed his anger till the morning intending then to reward Sian for his calumny and when Sian wished to depart he gave him a fine whip saying to him whenever you wish for anything only say whip give me a hundred and you will see pearls strung upon a rush Sian, thanking the youth went his way in great haste not wishing to make trial of the whip until he reached home but hardly had he set foot in the house when he went into a secret chamber intending to hide the money which he expected to receive from the whip and he said whip give me a hundred whereupon the whip gave him more than he looked for making counterpoint on his legs and face like a musical composer so that lise hearing his cries came running out of the study and when he saw that the whip like a runaway horse could not stop itself he opened the little box and brought it to a standstill then he asked Sian what had happened to him and upon hearing his story he told him he had no one to blame but himself for like a blockhead he alone had caused his misfortune acting like a camel that wanted to have horns and lose his ears he bade him mind another time and keep a bridle on his tongue which was the key that had opened to him the storehouse of misfortune for if he had spoken well of the youths he would perhaps have had the same good luck as himself and he cautioned him especially to speak well of every one in future good words being a merchandise that costs nothing and usually brings profit that is not expected in conclusion lise comforted him bidding him not seek more wealth than heaven had given him that his little casket would suffice to fill the houses of thirty misers and Sian should be master of all he possessed since to the generous man heaven is treasure and he added that although another brother might have ill will towards Sian for the cruelty with which he had treated him in his poverty yet he reflected that his avarice had been a favourable wind which had brought him to this port and therefore wished to show himself grateful for the benefit when Sian heard these things he begged his brother's pardon for the past unkindness and entering into partnership they enjoyed together their good fortune and from that time forward Sian spoke well of everything however bad it might be end of chapter seven
Chapter Eight of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter Eight A Stone in the Cock's Head. There was once in the city of Dark Grotto a certain man named mineco aniello who was so persecuted by fortune that all his household goods and movables consisted only of a short-legged cock which he had reared upon bread-crumbs but one morning being driven frantic by an appetite for hunger drives the wolf from the thicket he took it into his head to sell the cock and taking it to the market he met two thievish magicians with whom he made a bargain and sold it for half a crown they told him to take it to their house and they would count him out the money and they went their way but mineco aniello following them overheard them talking gibberish together and saying who would have told us that we would meet with such a piece of good luck generoni this cock will make our fortune to a certainty by the stone which you know he has in his pate we will quickly have it set in a ring, and then we shall have everything we could ask for. Be quiet, Jacobuccio, answered Generoni. I see myself rich and can hardly believe it, and I am longing to twist the cock's neck and give a kick in the face of beggary, for in this world virtue without money goes for nothing, and a man is judged of by his coat. When Mineco Aniello, who had travelled about in the world and eaten bread from more than one oven, heard this gibberish, he turned on his heel and scampered off, and running home he twisted the cock's neck, and opening its head found the stone, which he had instantly set in a brass ring. Then, to make a trial of its virtue, he said, I wish to become a youth eighteen years old. Hardly had he uttered the words, when his blood began to flow more quickly, his nerves became stronger, his limbs firmer, his flesh fresher, his eyes more fiery, his silver hairs were turned to gold, his mouth, which was a sacked village, became peopled with teeth, his beard, which was as thick as wood, became like a nursery garden. In short, he was changed to a most beautiful youth. Then he said again, I wish for a splendid palace, and to marry a king's daughter. And, lo, there instantly appeared a palace of incredible magnificence, in which were apartments that would amaze you, columns to astound you, pictures to fill you with wonder. Silver glittered around, and gold was trodden underfoot. The jewels dazzled your eyes, the servants swarmed like ants. The horses and carriages were not to be counted. In short, there was such a display of riches that the king stared at the sight, and willingly gave him his daughter, Nalalisia. Meanwhile, the magicians, having discovered Mineco Aniello's great wealth, laid a plan to rob him of his good fortune. So they made a pretty little doll which played and danced by means of clockwork and dressing themselves like merchants, they went to Pentella, the daughter of Mineco Aniello, under pretext of selling it to her. When Pentella saw the beautiful little thing, she asked them what price they put upon it, and they replied that it could not be bought for money, but that she might have it, and welcome, if she would only do them a favour, which was to let them see the make of the ring which her father possessed, in order to take a model and make another like it. Then they would give her the doll without any payment at all. Pentella, who had never heard the proverb, think well before you buy anything cheap, instantly accepted this offer, and bade them return the next morning, when she promised to ask her father to lend her the ring. So the magicians went away, and when her father returned home, Pentella coaxed and caressed him, until at last she persuaded him to give her the ring, making the excuse that she was sad at heart, and wished to divert her mind a little. When the next day came, as soon as the scavenger of the sun swept the last trace of the shades from the streets and squares of heaven, 
the magicians returned and no sooner had they the ring in their hands than they instantly vanished and not a trace of them was to be seen so that poor pentella had like to have died with terror but when the magicians came to a wood where the branches of some of the trees were dancing a sword dance and the boughs of others were playing together at hot cockles they desired the ring to break the spell by which the old man had become young again and instantly minecco aniello who was just at that minute in the presence of the king was suddenly seen to grow hoary his hairs to whiten his forehead to wrinkle his eyebrows to grow bristly his eyes to sink in his face to be furrowed his mouth to become toothless his beard to grow bushy his back to be humped his legs to tremble and above all his glittering garments to return to rags and tatters the king seeing this miserable beggar seated beside him at table ordered him to be instantly driven away with blows and hard words whereupon aniello thus suddenly fallen from his good luck went weeping to his daughter and asked for the ring in order to set matters to right again but when he heard the fatal trick of the false merchant he was ready to throw himself out of the window cursing a thousand times the ignorance of his daughter who for the sake of a silly doll had turned him into a miserable scarecrow and for a paltry thing of rags had brought him to rags himself adding that he was resolved to go wandering about the world like a bad shilling until he should get tidings of those merchants so saying he threw a cloak about his neck and a wallet on his back drew his sandals on his feet took a staff in his hand and leaving his daughter all chilled and frozen he set out walking desperately on until he came to the kingdom of deep hole inhabited by mice where having been taken for a big spy of the cats he was instantly led before rosecomb the king the king at once asked him who he was whence he came and what he was about in that country and minecco aniello after first giving the king a cheese pairing in sign of tribute related to him all his misfortunes one by one and concluded by saying that he was resolved to continue his toil and travel until he could get tidings of those thievish villains who had robbed him of so precious a jewel taking from him at once the flower of his youth the source of his wealth and the prop of his honour at these words rosecomb felt pity nibbling at his heart and wishing to comfort the poor man he summoned the oldest mice to a council and asked their opinions on the misfortunes of minecco aniello commanding them to use all diligence and endeavour to obtain some tidings of those false merchants now among the rest it happened that rudolo and saltariello were present good mice who were used to the ways of the world and had lived for six years at a tavern of great resort hard by and they said to aniello be of good heart comrade matters will turn out better than you imagine you must know that one day when we were in a room at the hostelry of the horn where the most famous men of the world lodge and make merry two persons from the hook castle came in who after they had eaten their fill and had seen the bottom of their flagon fell to talking of a trick they had played on a certain old man of dark grotto and how they had cheated him out of a stone of great value which one of them named generoni said he would never take from his finger that he might not run the risk of losing it as the old man's daughter had done when minecco aniello heard this he told the two mice that if they would trust themselves to accompany him to the country where these rogues lived and recover the ring for him he would give them a good lot of cheese and salt meat which they might eat and enjoy with his majesty the king then the two mice after bargaining for a suitable reward offered to go over sea and mountain and taking leave of his mousy majesty they set out after journeying a long way they arrived at hook castle where the mice told minecco aniello to remain under some trees on the brink of the river which much like a leech drew the moisture from the land and discharged it into the sea then they went to seek the house of the magicians and observing that generoni never took the ring from his finger they stood to gain the victory by stratagem 
so waiting till night had dyed with purple grape juice the sunburnt face of heaven and the magicians had gone to bed and were fast asleep rudolo began to nibble the finger on which the ring was whereupon generoni feeling the smart took the ring off and laid it on a table at the bed's head but as soon as saltariello saw this he bobbed the ring into his mouth and in four skips he was off to find minecco aniello and with even greater joy than the man at the gallows fields when the pardon arrives he instantly turned the magicians into two jackasses and throwing his mantle over one of them he bestrode him like a noble count then he loaded the other with cheese and bacon and set off toward deep hole where having given presents to the king and his counsellors he thanked them for all the good fortune he had received by their assistance praying heaven that no mouse-trap might ever lay hold of them that no cat might ever harm them and that no arsenic might ever poison them then leaving that country minecco aniello returned to dark grotto even more handsome than before and was received by the king and his daughter with the greatest affection of the heart and having ordered the two asses cast down from a rock he lived happily with his wife never more taking the ring from his finger that he might not again commit such a folly End of chapter eight chapter nine of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 9 The Fox and the Cat. In a certain forest there once lived a fox, and near to the fox lived a man who had a cat that had been a good mouser in its youth, but was now old and half blind. The man didn't want Puss any longer, but not liking to kill him, took him out into the forest and lost him there. Then the fox came up and said, Why, Mr. Shaggy Matthew, how do you do? What brings you here? Alas, said Pussy, my master loved me as long as I could bite, but now that I can bite no longer and have left off catching mice, and I used to catch them finely once, he doesn't like to kill me, but he has left me in the wood where I must perish miserably. No, dear pussy, said the fox, you leave it to me, and I'll help you get your daily bread. You are very good, dear little sister foxy, said the cat, and the fox built him a little shed with a garden round it to walk about in. Now one day the hare came to steal the man's cabbage. Grim, grim, grim he squeaked but the cat popped his head out of the window and when he saw the hare he put up his back and stuck up his tail and said <laughs> the hare was frightened and ran away and told the bear the wolf and the wild boar all about it never mind said the bear i tell you what we'll all four give a banquet and invite the fox and the cat and do for the pair of them now look here i'll steal the man's mead and you mr wolf steal his fat pot and you mr wild boar root up his fruit trees and you mr bunny go and invite the fox and the cat to dinner so they made everything ready as the bear had said and the hare ran off to invite the guests he came beneath the window and said we invite your little ladyship foxy woxy together with mr shaggy matthew to dinner and back he ran again but you should have told them to bring their spoons with them said the bear oh what a head i've got if i didn't quite forget cried the hare and back he went again ran beneath the window and cried mind you bring your spoons very well said the fox so the cat and the fox went to the banquet and when the cat saw the bacon he put up his back and stuck out his tail and cried mew mew with all his might but they thought he said malo malo what said the bear who was hiding behind the beeches with the other beasts 
here have all we four been getting together all we could and this pig-faced cat calls it too little what a monstrous cat he must be to have such an appetite so they were all four very frightened and the bear climbed up a tree and the others hid where they could but when the cat saw the boar's bristles sticking out from behind the bushes he thought it was a mouse and put up his back again and cried <laughs> then they were more frightened than ever and the boar went into a bush still farther off and the wolf went behind an oak and the bear got down from the tree and climbed up into a bigger one and the hare ran right away but the cat remained in the midst of all the good things and ate away at the bacon and the little fox gobbled up all the honey and they ate and ate till they couldn't eat any more and then they both went home licking their paws End of chapter 9chapter ten of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter ten the straw ox there was once upon a time an old man and an old woman the old man worked in the fields as a pitch burner while the old woman sat at home and spun flax they were so poor that they could save nothing at all all their earnings went in bare food and when that was gone there was nothing left at last the old woman had a good idea look now husband cried she make me a straw ox and smear it all over with tar why you foolish woman said he what's the good of an ox of that sort never mind said she you just make it i know what i'm about what was the poor man to do he set to work and made the ox of straw and smeared it all over with tar the night passed away and at early dawn the old woman took her distaff and drove the straw ox into the steppe to graze and she herself sat down behind a hillock and began spinning her flax and cried graze away little ox while i spin my flax graze away little ox while i spin my flax and while she spun her head drooped down and she began to doze and while she was dozing from behind the dark wood and from the back of the huge pines a bear came rushing out upon the ox and said who are you speak and tell me and the ox said a three-year-old heifer am i made of straw and smeared with tar oh said the bear stuffed with straw and trimmed with tar are you then give me of your straw and tar that i may patch up my ragged fur again take some said the ox and the bear fell upon him and began to tear away at the tar he tore and tore and buried his teeth in it till he found he couldn't let go again he tugged and he tugged but it was no good and the ox dragged him gradually off goodness knows where then the old woman awoke and there was no ox to be seen alas old fool that i am cried she perchance it has gone home then she quickly caught up her distaff and spinning board threw them over her shoulders and hastened off home and she saw that the ox had dragged the bear up to the fence and in she went to her old man dad dad she cried look look the ox has brought us a bear come out and kill it then the old man jumped up tore off the bear tied him up and threw him in the cellar next morning between dark and dawn the old woman took her distaff and drove the ox into the steppe to graze she herself sat down by a mound began spinning and said graze graze away little ox while i spin my flax graze graze away little ox while i spin my flax and while she spun her head drooped down and she dozed and lo from behind the dark wood from the back of the huge pines a grey wolf came rushing out upon the ox and said who are you come tell me i am a three-year-old heifer 
stuffed with straw and trimmed with tar said the ox oh trimmed with tar are you then give me of your tar to tar my sides that the dogs and sons of dogs tear me not take some said the ox and with that the wolf fell upon him and tried to tear the tar off he tugged and tugged and tore with his teeth but could get none off then he tried to let go and couldn't tug and worry as he might it was no good when the old woman woke there was no heifer in sight maybe my heifer has gone home she cried i'll go home and see when she got there she was astonished for by the paling stood the ox with the wolf still tugging at it she ran and told her old man and her old man came and threw the wolf into the cellar also on the third day the old woman again drove her ox into the pastures to graze and sat down by a mound and dozed off then a fox came running up who are you it asked the ox i am a three-year-old heifer stuffed with straw and daubed with tar then give me some of your tar to smear my sides with when those dogs and sons of dogs tear my hide take some said the ox then the fox fastened her teeth in him and couldn't draw them out again the old woman told her old man and he took and cast the fox into the cellar in the same way and after that they caught pussy swiftfoot likewise so when they had got them all safely the old man sat down on the bench before the cellar and began sharpening a knife and the bear said to him tell me daddy what are you sharpening your knife for to flay your skin off that i might make a leather jacket for myself and a pelisse for my old woman oh don't flay me daddy dear rather let me go and i'll bring you a lot of honey very well see you do it and he unbound and let the bear go then he sat down on the bench and again began sharpening his knife and the wolf asked him daddy what are you sharpening your knife for to flay off your skin that i may make me a warm cap against the winter oh don't flay me daddy dear and i'll bring you a whole herd of little sheep well see that you do it and he let the wolf go then he sat down and began sharpening his knife again the fox put out her little snout and asked him be so kind daddy dear and tell me why you are sharpening your knife little foxes said the old man have nice skins that do capitally for collars and trimmings and i want to skin you oh don't take my skin away daddy dear and i will bring you hens and geese very well see that you do it and he let the fox go the hare now alone remained and the old man began sharpening his knife on the hare's account why do you do that asked puss and he replied little hares have nice little soft warm skins which will make me nice gloves and mittens against the winter oh daddy dear don't flay me and i'll bring you kale and good cauliflower if only you let me go then he let the hare go also then they went to bed early but very early in the morning when it was neither dusk nor dawn there was a noise in the doorway like Durr! daddy cried the old woman there's some one scratching at the door go and see who it is the old man went out and there was the bear carrying a whole hive full of honey the old man took the honey from the bear but no sooner did he lie down again than there was another Durr! at the door the old man looked out and saw the wolf driving a whole flock of sheep into the courtyard close on his heels came the fox driving before him geese and hens and all manner of fowls and last of all came the hare bringing cabbage and kale and all manner of good food and the old man was glad and the old woman was glad and the old man sold the sheep and oxen and got so rich that he needed nothing more as for the straw-stuffed ox it stood in the sun till it fell to pieces end of chapter ten chapter eleven of tales of laughter 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. The Cat, the Cock, and the Fox there was once upon a time a cat and a cock who agreed to live together so they built them a hut in a barnyard and the cock kept house while the cat went foraging for sausages one day the fox came running up open the door little cock cried she pussy told me not to little fox said the cock open the door little cock repeated the fox i tell you pussy told me not to little fox at last however the cock grew tired of always saying no so he opened the door and in the fox rushed seized him in her jaws and ran off with him then the cock cried help pussy pussy that fox hussy has got me tight with all her might across her tail my legs do trail along the bridge so stony the cat heard it gave chase to the fox rescued the cock brought him home scolded him well and said now keep out of her jaws in the future if you don't want to be killed altogether then the cat went out foraging for wheat so that the cock might have something to eat he had scarcely gone when the sly she-fox again came creeping up dear little cock said she pray open the door nay little fox pussy said i wasn't to but the fox went on asking and asked till at last the cock let him in when the fox rushed at him seized him by the neck and ran off with him then the cock cried out help pussy pussy that fox hussy has got me tight with all her might across her tail my legs do trail along the bridge so stony the cat heard it and again he ran after the fox and rescued the cock and gave the fox a sound drubbing then he said to the cock now mind you never let her come in again or she'll eat you but the next time the cat went out the she-fox came again and said dear little cock open the door no little fox pussy said i wasn't to but the fox begged and begged so piteously that at last the cock was quite touched and opened the door then the fox caught him by the throat again and ran away with him and the cock cried help pussy pussy that fox hussy has got me tight with all her might across her tail my legs do trail along the bridge so stony the cat heard it and gave chase again he ran and ran but this time he couldn't catch the fox up so he returned home and wept bitterly because he was now all alone at last however he dried his tears and got a little fiddle a little fiddle bow and a big sack and went to the fox's hole and began to play fiddle dee dee the foxy so we had daughters twice two and a little son too oh fiddle dee dee come foxy and see my sweet ministry then the fox's daughter said mommy i'll go out and see who it is that's playing so nicely so out she skipped but no sooner did pussy see her than he caught hold of her and popped her in his sack then he played again fiddle de dee the fox so we had daughters twice two and a little son too oh fiddle de dee come foxy and see my sweet ministry then the second daughter skipped out and pussy caught her by the forehead and popped her in his sack and went on playing and singing till he had got all four daughters into his sack and the little son also 
then the old fox was left all alone and she waited and waited but not one of them came back at last she said to herself i'll go out and call them home for the cock is roasting and the milk pottage is simmering and tis high time we had something to eat so out she popped and the cat pounced upon her and killed her too then he went and drank up all the soup and gobbled up all the pottage and then he saw the cock lying on a plate come shake yourself cock said puss so the cock shook himself and got up and the cat took the cock home and the dead foxes too and when they got home they skinned them to make nice beds to lie upon and lived happily together in peace and plenty and as they laughed over the joke as a good joke we may laugh over it too end of chapter eleven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter twelve of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by christine layman reseda california tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter twelve the fox and the dove once upon a time there was a dove who built her nest in a high tree every year about the time when her young ones were beginning to get feathers reynard slyboots would come along and say to the dove give me your young ones to eat throw them down to me of your own accord or i will gobble you up as well as them the dove frightened at the threat would throw down the young birds and thus it had happened year after year now one day as the dove sat most melancholy upon her nest a great bird flew up and asked why she was so sad and downcast and the dove answered that it was because reynard would soon come and eat up her young ones upon this the great bird replied oh you goose why do you throw them down to him just bid your good friend to please give himself the trouble to come after them then you'll soon see him sneak away with his tail between his legs for reynard cannot climb a tree so when the time came round and reynard again presented himself the dove said to him if you want meat for dinner just be so kind as to come up and help yourself when the fox saw that he must go away empty he asked the dove who had counselled her to speak thus and she answered the great bird that has a nest yonder near the stream reynard at once betook himself to the stream and remonstrated with the great bird for building his nest in so exposed a place asking what he did in case of a high wind the great bird answered when the wind blows from the right i turn to the left when it blows from the left i turn to the right but what do you do when it blows from all sides asked the fox then i stick my head under my wing said the great bird showing how he did it but quick as a wink when the great bird stuck his head under his wing reynard slyboots sprang upon him and seized him saying you know how to give counsel to others but not to advise yourself so he ate him up end of chapter twelve recording by christine layman reseda california chapter thirteen of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by christine layman reseda california tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter thirteen the fox and the hedgehog a hedgehog met master reynard in a field and said to him hello master whither away oh i'm just loafing around answered the fox 
tell me now said reynard to the hedgehog after they had been chatting a while how manifold is your understanding threefold answered the hedgehog why how is that asked the fox why you see i have one sense above one below and the third everywhere replied the hedgehog and added and how manifold is your understanding oh mine is seventy-sevenfold answered the fox well well said the hedgehog thereupon they walked along through the fields and so eagerly were they talking that they gave no heed to the way and presently stumbled into a wolf's den then was good counsel precious how should they ever get out of this scrape said reynard to the hedgehog come now search around in your headpiece for a means of getting out of this pickle i should have done that before answered the hedgehog but i was afraid that by and by you would curse me how shall i a little hedgehog with only a threefold understanding devise anything better than you who have a seventy-sevenfold understanding however after talking back and forth a long time the hedgehog made this suggestion say reynard just seize me by the ear and throw me up out of the den because i am the smaller yes but how shall i get out oh just stick up your tail and i will pull you out so reynard seized the hedgehog by the ear and tossed him up out of the den then he called upon him to keep his word hello there gossip now pull me out do you know what answered the hedgehog i'll tell you something i have only a threefold understanding and yet i found a way of helping myself now do you help yourself with your seventy-sevenfold understanding by this time a peasant came along and finding the fox in the den he made short work with him but the hedgehog crept away through the thicket with his threefold understanding while reynard with all his seventy-sevenfold understanding was carried off by the peasant end of chapter thirteen recording by christine layman reseda california chapter fourteen of tales of laughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by christine layman reseda california tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter fourteen the disappointed bear once upon a time a little old woman who was walking in the forest climbed up into a wild cherry tree to gather cherries now a bear espied her and he came under the tree and cried come down old woman that i may eat you go along with you answered the old woman why should you eat a scrawny old woman like me here gnaw upon my shoe till i come down and i will take you to my house i have two little children there named janko and mirko they will make you a right savoury dish so have patience till you get them so said the little old woman and threw down one of her shoes master bruin gnawed and gnawed upon it but the more he gnawed the hungrier he grew greatly enraged he screamed up to the old woman come down you old wench and let me eat you just wait a little longer till the old wench has gathered enough cherries she answered here gnaw this other shoe a while she'll soon come down and show you the way to her house so saying she threw down the other shoe when bruin found that the second shoe was no juicier than the first he made no further effort but contented himself with thinking of the fat little children at the old woman's house when she had gathered cherries enough down she came and went home the bear tramping along behind her when they reached the house the old woman said i'll tell you what first let me give the children a good supper that they may be all the fatter and meanwhile do you run about till evening to get up a better appetite 
so bruin went away and ran about in the woods all the rest of the day and at evening he came back to the hut here i am little mother he cried now bring out jonko and mirko and see me polish them off i am starving to death oh ho answered the little old woman from within jonko has made the door fast with bolts and i have just put mirko to sleep i couldn't think of waking him and the little mother is so old and weak that she can't unbolt the door alone come some other day then master bruin perceived that he had been fooled and he walked reluctantly away with drooping snout and an empty stomach End of chapter 14 Recording by Christine Lehman, Reseda, California Chapter 15 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org recording by christine layman reseda california tales of laughter by nora archibald smith and kate douglas wiggin chapter fifteen young neverfull a certain housewife had a young servant lad who devoured everything eatable that lay in his way he would rummage in the storeroom until he smelled out something good, and would give himself no rest until he had devoured it all. Now the woman had a jar of preserved fruit, and as she feared that the youngster would eat it and leave her nothing to put into her pies, she said to him, "'My good boy, you have now eaten everything that I have except this jam, and you have left this just as if you knew that it was poisoned.' see how kind heaven is to have preserved you from it one single spoonful is enough to kill one instantly so i warn you not to touch it unless you want to die very well answered the boy on the next sunday as the woman was getting ready to go to mass she said to the boy cook the soup and boil the meat and roast this duck we will have a good dinner to-day see that you have all done and ready when i come home very well it shall all be done answered the boy when the woman was gone he cooked the soup and boiled the meat and then he put the duck upon the spit to roast when he saw what a delicious brown crisp was forming all over the duck he thought it can roast itself another one and ate the crisp all off he turned the spit and turned it but the second brown crisp never came when he saw this he thought when the mistress comes home she will pepper me well and he began to consider how he could escape a beating in his desperation he remembered the jar of poison against which his mistress had warned him the day before with a sudden resolution he went into the storeroom and devoured the whole jarful of preserved fruit and then crouched down in a corner to wait for death presently his mistress came home and cried out angrily what have you done to this duck she was about to belabor him well when he cried ah oh, leave me in peace dear mistress i shall die in a minute anyway for i have eaten up all the poison at this the woman broke out into a laugh and could not refuse to forgive him the duck and the preserves however were gone all the same End of chapter fifteen recording by christine layman reseda california Chapter Sixteen of Tales of Laughter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter Sixteen. Hutton and Dudden and Donald O'Neary. There was once upon a time two farmers, and their names were Hutton and Dudden they had poultry in their yards sheep on the uplands and scores of cattle in the meadowland alongside the river but for all that they weren't happy for just between their two farms there lived a poor man by the name of donald o'neary 
he had a hovel over his head and a strip of grass that was barely enough to keep his one cow daisy from starving and though she did her best it was but seldom that donald got a drink of milk or a roll of butter from daisy you would think there was little here to make hudden and dudden jealous but so it is the more one has the more one wants and donald's neighbours lay awake of nights scheming how they might get hold of his little strip of grassland daisy poor thing they never thought of she was just a bag of bones one day hudden met dudden and they were soon grumbling as usual and all to the tune of if only we could get that vagabond donald o'neary out of the country let's kill daisy said hudden at last if that doesn't make him clear out nothing will no sooner said than agreed and it wasn't dark before hudden and dudden crept up to the little shed where lay poor daisy trying her best to chew the cud though she hadn't had as much grass in the day as would cover your hand and when donald came to see if daisy was all snug for the night the poor beast had only time to lick his hand once before she died well donald was a shrewd fellow and downhearted though he was began to think if he could get any good out of daisy's death he thought and he thought and the next day you might have seen him trudging off early to the fair daisy's hide over his shoulder every penny he had jingling in his pockets just before he got to the fair he made several slits in the hide put a penny in each slit walked into the best inn of the town as bold as if it belonged to him and hanging the hide up to a nail in the wall sat down some of your best whisky says he to the landlord but the landlord didn't like his looks is it fearing i won't pay you you are said donald why i have a hide here that gives me all the money i want and with that he hit it a whack with his stick and out hopped a penny the landlord opened his eyes as you may fancy what'll you take for that hide it's not for sale my good man will you take a gold piece it's not for sale i tell you hasn't it kept me and mine for years and with that donald hit the hide another whack and out jumped a second penny well the long and the short of it was that donald let the hide go and that very evening who but he should walk up to hudden's door good evening hudden will you lend me your best pair of scales hudden stared and hudden scratched his head but he lent the scales when donald was safe at home he put out his pocket full of bright gold and began to weigh each piece in the scales but hudden had put a lump of butter at the bottom and so the last piece of gold stuck fast to the scales when he took them back to hudden if hudden had stared before he stared ten times more now and no sooner was donald's back turned than he was off as hard as he could pelt to dudden's good evening dudden that vagabond bad luck to him you mean donald o'neary and who else should i mean he's back here weighing out sapfuls of gold how do you know that here are my scales that he borrowed and here's a gold piece still sticking to them off they went together and they came to donald's door donald had finished making the last pile of ten gold pieces and he couldn't finish because a piece had stuck to the scales in they walked without an if you please or by your leave well i never that was all they could say good evening hudden good evening dudden ah you thought that you had paid me a fine trick but you never did me a better turn in all your lives when i found poor daisy dead i thought to myself well her hide may fetch something and it did hides are worth their weight in gold in the market just now hudden nudged dudden and dudden winked at hudden good evening donald o'neary good evening kind friends the next day there wasn't a cow or a calf that belonged to hudden or dudden but her hide was going to the fair in hudden's biggest cart drawn by dudden's strongest pair of horses when they came to the fair each one took a hide over his arm 
and there they were walking through the fair bawling out at the top of their voices hides to sell hides to sell out came the tanner how much for your hides my good men they're weight in gold it's early in the day to come out of the tavern that was all the tanner said and back he went to his yard hides to sell fine fresh hides to sell out came the cobbler how much for your hides my men they're weight in gold is it making a game of me you are take that for your pains and the cobbler dealt hudden a blow that made him stagger up the people came running from one end of the fair to the other what's the matter what's the matter cried they here are a couple of vagabonds selling hides at their weight in gold said the cobbler hold em fast hold em fast bawled the innkeeper who was the last to come up he was so fat i'll wager it's one of those rogues who tricked me out of thirty gold pieces yesterday for a wretched hide it was more kicks than halfpence that hudden and dudden got before they were well on their way home again and they didn't run the slower because all the dogs of the town were at their heels well as you may fancy if they loved donald little before they loved him less now what's the matter friends said he as he saw them tearing along their hats knocked in and their coats torn off and their faces black and blue is it fighting you've been or mayhap you met the police ill luck to them we'll police you you vagabond it's mighty smart you thought yourself deluding us with your lying tales who deluded you didn't you see the gold with your own two eyes but it was no use talking pay for it he must and should there was a meal sack handy and into it hudden and dudden popped donald o'neary tied him up tight ran a pole through the knot and off they started for the brown lake of the bog each with a pole end on his shoulder and donald o'neary between but the brown lake was far the road was dusty hudden and dudden were sore and weary and parched with thirst there was an inn by the roadside let's go in said hudden i'm dead beat it's heavy he is for the little he had to eat if hudden was willing so was dudden as for donald you may be sure his leave wasn't asked but he was dumped down at the inn door for all the world as if he had been a sack of potatoes sit still you vagabond said dudden if we don't mind waiting you needn't donald held his peace but after a while he heard the glasses clink and hudden singing away at the top of his voice i won't have her i tell you i won't have her said donald but nobody heeded what he said i won't have her i tell you i won't have her said donald and this time he said it louder but nobody heeded what he said i won't have her i tell you i won't have her said donald and this time he said it as loud as he could and who won't you have may i be so bold as to ask said a farmer who had just come up with a drove of cattle and was turning in for a glass it's the king's daughter they are bothering the life out of me to marry her you're a lucky fellow i'd give something to be in your shoes do you see that now wouldn't it be a fine thing for a farmer to be marrying a princess all dressed in gold and jewels jewels do you say ah now couldn't you take me with you well you're an honest fellow and as i don't care for the king's daughter though she's as beautiful as the day and is covered with jewels from top to toe you shall have her just undo the cord and let me out they tied me up tight as they knew i'd run away from her out crawled donald in crept the farmer now lie still and don't mind the shaking it's only rumbling over the palace steps you'll be and maybe they'll abuse you for a vagabond who won't have the king's daughter but you needn't mind that ah it's a deal i'm giving up for you sure as it is that i don't care for the princess take my cattle in exchange said the farmer and you may guess it wasn't long before donald was at their tails driving them homeward out came hudden and dudden and the one took one end of the pole and the other the other 
"'I'm thinking he's heavier,' said Hudden. "'Ah, never mind,' said Dudden. "'It's only a step now to the brown lake.' "'I'll have her now, I'll have her now,' bawled the farmer from inside the sack. "'By my faith, and you shall, though,' said Hudden, and he laid his stick across the sack. "'I'll have her, I'll have her,' bawled the farmer louder than ever. "'Well, here you are,' said Dudden, for they were now come to the brown lake, and unslinging the sack, they pitched it plump into the lake. "'You'll not be playing your tricks on us any longer,' said Hudden. "'True for you,' said Dudden. "'Ah, Donald, my boy, it was an ill day when you borrowed my scales.' Off they went, with a light step and an easy heart. But when they were near home, whom should they see but Donald O'Neary? And all around him the cows were grazing, and the calves were kicking up their heels and butting their heads together. "'Is it you, Donald?' said Dudden. "'Faith, you've been quicker than we have.' "'True for you, Dudden, and let me thank you kindly.' The turn was good, if the will was ill. You have heard, like me, that the brown lake leads to the land of promise. I always put it down as lies, but it is just as true as my word. Look at the cattle. Hudden stared, and Dudden gaped, but they couldn't get over the cattle. Fine, fat cattle they were, too. It's only the worst I could bring up with me, said Donald O'Neary. The others were so fat there was no driving them. Faith, too, it's little wonder they didn't care to leave, with grass as far as you could see, and as sweet and juicy as fresh butter. Ah, now, Donald, we haven't always been friends, said Dudden, but as I was just saying, you were ever a decent lad, and you'll show us the way, won't you? I don't see that I'm called upon to do that. There is a power more cattle down there. Why shouldn't I have them all to myself? "'Faith, they may well say, the richer you get, the harder the heart. "'You always were a neighbourly lad, Donald. "'You wouldn't wish to keep the luck all to yourself.' "'True for you, Hudden, though it's a bad example you set me. "'But I'll not be thinking of old times. "'There is plenty for all there, so come along with me.' "'Off they trudged, with a light heart and an eager step. "'When they came to the brown lake, the sky was full of little white clouds. "'And if the sky was full... The lake was as full. "'Ah, now, look, there they are,' cried Donald, as he pointed to the clouds in the lake. "'Where, where?' cried Hudden, and, "'Don't be greedy,' cried Dudden, as he jumped his hardest to be up first with the fat cattle. But if he jumped first, Hudden wasn't long behind. They never came back. Maybe they got too fat, like the cattle. As for Donald O'Neary, he had cattle and sheep all his days to his heart's content. End of chapter 16。Chapter 17 of Tales of Laughter。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Hill. Tales of Laughter by Wigan and Smith. The Tale. There was a shepherd once who went out to the hill to look after his sheep. It was misty and cold, and he had much trouble to find them. At last, he had them all but one, and after much searching, he found that one too in a peat hag half drowned. So he took off his plaid and bent down and took hold of the sheep's tail, and he pulled. The sheep was heavy with water, and he could not lift her, so he took off his coat, and he pulled, but it was too much for him. So he spit on his hands, and took a good hold of the tail, and he pulled, and the tail broke. And if it had not been for that, this tail would have been a great deal longer. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Tales of Laughter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Tales of Laughter by Nora Archibald Smith and Kate Douglas Wiggin. Chapter 18 Jack and the King Who Was a Gentleman. Well, children, once upon a time, when pigs were swine, there was a poor widdy woman lived all alone with her one son Jack in a wee hut of a house that on a dark night ye might easily walk over it by mistake not knowing at all at all it was there barring ye'd happen to strike your toe agin it and jack and his mother lived for lee and long as happy as hard times would allow them in this wee hut of a house jack striving to earn a little support for them both by working out and doing wee turns back and forward to the neighbours but there was one winter and times come to look black enough for them nothing to do and less to eat and clothe themselves as best they might and the winter wore on getting harder and harder till at length when jack got up out of his bed on a morning and asked his mother to make ready the drop of stirabout for their little brackwus as usual musha jack armich said his mother and she the mailchist thanks be to the lord is as empty as paddy ruith donkey that used to ate these brookwus at supper time it stood out long and well but it's empty at last jack and no sign o how we're going to get it filled again only we trust in the good lord that niver yet decided the widow and the orphan he'll not see us wanting jack the lord helps them that helps themselves mother said jack back again to her through for ye jack says she but i don't see how we're going to help ourselves he's a mortial dead mule out and out that hasn't a kick in him says jack a mother with the help of providence not comparing the christian to the brute base i have a kick in me yet if you thought you could only manage to strive along the best way you could for a week or maybe two weeks till i get back again off a little journey i'd like to undertake and may i make bold to ax jack said his mother to him where would you be after making the little journey to you may that then mother says jack it's this you know the king of munster is a great gentleman entirely it's put on him he's so gentlemanly that he was never yet known to make use of a wrong or disrespectable word and he prides himself on it so much that he has sent word all over the known earth that he'll give his beautiful daughter the loveliest picture in all munster and maybe in all ireland if we'd say it and her weight in gold to any man that in three trials will make him use the unrespectful word and say you're a liar but every man that tries him and fails loses his head all sorts and descriptions of people from princes and peers down to bagmen and beggars have come from all parts of the known world to thrive for the great prize and all of em up to this has failed and by consequence lost their heads but mother dear says jack where's the use in a head to a man if he can't get mail for it to eight so i'm going to thrive me fortune only ax him for your blissin and god's blissin to help me on me way why jack a sage said his mother it's a dangersome task but as you remark where's the good of the head to you when you can't get mail to put in it so i'll give you me blessing and night noon and morning i'll be praying for you to prosper and jack set out with his heart as light as his stomach and his pocket as light as them both together but a man'll not travel far in old ireland thanks be to god on the barefooted stomach as we'll call it or if it's be his own fault if he does and jack didn't want for plenty of first-class eating and drinking lashings and lavings and pressing him to more and in this way he travelled away afore him for five long days till he come to the king of munster's castle and when he was come there he rattled on the gate and out come the king well me man says the king what might be your business here i'm come here your kingship says jack mighty polite and pullin his forelock be raisin his poor old mother had always instructed him in the height of good breeding i'm come here your royal highness says jack to try for your daughter hum says the king me good young man says he don't you think it a poor thing to lose your head 
if i lose it says jack sure one consolation will be i'll lose it in a glorious cause and who do you think would be listening to this same deludering speech of jack's from over the wall but the king's beautiful daughter herself she took an eyeful out of jack and right well pleased she was with his appearance for father says she at once hasn't the boy as good a right to get a chance as another what's his head to you let the boy in says she and sure enough without another word the king took jack within the gates and handing him over to the servants told him to be well looked after and cared for till morning next morning the king took jack with him and fetched him out of the yard now then jack says he we're going to begin we'll drop into the stables here and i'll give you your first chance so he took jack into the stables and showed him some wonderful big horses the likes of which poor jack never saw afore and every one of which was the height of the side wall of the castle and could step over the castle walls which were twenty-five feet high without straining themselves them's pretty big horses jack says the king i don't suppose ever ye saw as big or as wonderful as them in your life oh they're pretty big indeed says jack taking it as cool as if there was nothing whatsoever astonishing to him about them they're pretty big indeed says jack for this country but at home with us in donegal we'd only count them little nags suitable for the young ladies to drive in pony carriages what says the king do you mean to tell me you have seen bigger in donegal bigger says jack phew blood alive your kingship i seen horses in my father's stable that could step over your horses without tripping my father owned one big horse the greatest i believe in the world again what was he like says the king well your highness says jack it's quite beyond me to tell ye what he was like but i know when we wanted to mount it could only be done by means of a step ladder with nine hundred and ninety nine steps to it every step a mile high and you had to jump seven mile off the topmost step to get on his back he ate nine ton of turnips nine ton of oats and nine ton of hay in a day and it took ninety-nine men in the daytime and ninety-nine more in the night-time carrying his feeds to him and when he wanted a drink the ninety-nine men had to lead him to a lal that was nine mile long nine mile broad and nine mile deep and he used to drink it dry every time says jack and then he looked at the king expecting surely to have made a liar of him for that but the king only smiled at jack and says he jack that was a wonderful horse entirely and no mistake then he took jack with him out into the garden for his second trial and showed him a bee-skep the size of the biggest rick of hay ever jack had seen and every bee in the skep was the size of a thrush and the queenie bee as big as a jackdaw jack says the king says he isn't them wonderful bees i'll warrant ye ye never saw anything like them oh they're middlin', middlin' fairish says jack for this country but they're nothing at all to the bees we have in donegal if one of our bees was flying across the fields says jack and one of your bees happened to come in its way and fall into our bee's eye our bee would fly to the skep and ask another bee to take the moat out of his eye do you tell me so jack says the king you must have great monsters of bees monsters said jack ah your highness monsters is no name for some of them i remember says jack says he a mighty great breed of bees my father owned they were that big that when my father's new castle was a building in the steading of the old one which he conserved to be too small for a man of his manes and when the workmen closed in the roof it was found there was a bee inside and the hall door not being wide enough they had to toss the side wall to let it out then the queenie bee ah she was a wonderful beast entirely says jack whenever she went out to take the air she used to overturn all the ditches and hedges in the country the wind of her wings tossed houses and castles she used to swallow whole flower gardens 
and one day she flew against a ridge of mountains nineteen thousand feet high and knocked a piece out from top to bottom and it's called barnsmore gap to this day this queenie bee was a great trouble and annoyance to my father seeing all the harm she done the neighbours round about and once she took it in her head to fly over to england and she created such mischief and desolation there that the king of england wrote over to my father if he didn't come immediately and take home his queenie bee that was racking and ruining all afore her he come over himself at the head of all his army and wiped my father off the face of the earth so my father ordered me to mount our wonderful big horse that i told you about and that could go nineteen mile at every step and go over to england and bring home our queenie bee and i mounted the horse and started and when i come as far as the sea i had crossed to get over to england i put the horse's two forefeet into my hat and in that way she thrashed the sea dry all the way across and landed me safely when i come to the king of england he had to supply me with nine hundred and ninety nine thousand men and ninety nine thousand mile of chains and ropes to catch the queenie bee and bind her it took us nine years to catch her nine more to tie her and nine years and nine millions of men to drag her home and the king of england was a beggar after from that day till the day of his death now what do you think of that bee says jack thinking he had the king this time sure enough but the king was a cuter one than jack took him for and he only smiled again and says he well jack that was a wonderful great queenie bee entirely next for poor jack's third and last chance the king took him to show him a wonderful field of beans he had with every beanstalk fifteen feet high and every bean the size of a goose's egg well jack says the king says he i'll engage ye never saw more wonderful beanstalks than them is it them says jack ah man your kingship says he they may be very good for this country but sure we'd throw them out of the ground for useless aftershoots in donegal i mind one beanstalk in particular that my father had for a show and a curiosity that he used to show as a great wonder entirely to strangers it stood on ninety-nine acres of ground it was nine hundred mile high and every leaf covered nine acres it fed nine thousand horses nine thousand mules and nine thousand jackasses for nineteen years he used to send nine thousand harvestmen up the stalk in spring to cut and gather off the soft branches at the top they used to cut these off when they'd reach up as far as them which was always in the harvest time and throw them down and nine hundred and ninety nine horses and carts were kept busy for nine months carting the stuff away then the harvestmen always reached down to the foot of the stalk at christmas again fay jack said the king it was a wonderful beanstalk that entirely you might say that says jack trying to make the most of it for he was now on his last leg you might say that says he why i mind one year i went up the stalk with the harvestmen and when i was nine thousand mile up doesn't i miss a foot and down i come i fell feet foremost and sunk up to my chin in a winston rock that was at the foot there i was in a quandary but i was not long ruminating till i hauled out my knife and cut off my head and sent it home to look for help i watched after it as i went away and lo and behold ye afore it had gone half a mile i saw a fox set on it and begin to worry it by this and by that says i to myself but this is too bad and i jumped out and away as hard as i could run to the assistance of my head and when i come up i lifted my foot and give the fox three kicks and knocked three kings out of him every one of them a nicer and a better gentleman than you you're a liar and a rascally liar says the king more power to ye says jack giving three buck leaps clean into the air and it's proud i am to get you to confess it for i have won your daughter right enough the king had to give up to jack the daughter and by the same token from the first time she clapped her two eyes on jack she wasn't the girl to gainsay him and her weight in gold and they were both of them married 
and had such a wedding as surpassed all the weddings ever was heard tell of afore or since in that country or in this and jack lost no time in sending for his poor old mother and neither herself nor jack ever after knew what it was to be in want and may you and i never know that same neither End of chapter eighteen